Chapter 4 By the time Cole paused to catch his breath, he found himself outside the bay, angling toward the next island, maybe a mile away. The icy water numbed him deeper with each breath. He gulped at the air. He had to make it before he froze to death. His arms ached, but he continued stroking, even as his mind wandered. Following Cole's acceptance for circle justice, preparation meetings, called Circles of Understanding, took place. Each meeting was considered a healing circle, but had a different name, depending on what was being discussed and who attended. There were talking circles, peacemaking circles, and community circles. Eventually there would be bail circles and sentencing circles. Is everything always in a circle? Cole had asked Garvey. Why not? Garvey said. Life is a circle. Do I have to go to all these meetings? Garvey shook his head. The organizers of the circles are called keepers. When the keepers meet with people like Peter and his family, you're not allowed. Why do they meet with them? If the Driscolls realize that the circle allows them to have a voice in decisions and that forgiveness can help Peter to heal, they may also join the circle. You mean they might help decide my sentence? Garvey nodded. Maybe. They'll hang me, Cole said. I'm dead. I think you've already hung yourself, Garvey answered. Once preparations were ready for the first hearing circle, notices were sent out and meetings were held in the basement of the public library. Cole scratched nervously at his stomach as he entered the library the first night. He didn't know what to expect as the guard removed his handcuffs outside the meeting room and let him walk in alone. The guard remained in the hallway. The woman who called herself the Keeper met Cole and shook his hand. Thanks for coming tonight, she said pleasantly. She wore blue jeans and a flannel shirt, even though she was old enough to be Cole's grandmother. I didn't have much choice, Cole mumbled as he seated himself. He picked at the edge of his chair as he watched complete strangers file in and choose seats. The number of chairs made it obvious the hearing circle involved a lot more people than the other meetings. To make matters worse, Cole knew that tonight he might see Peter for the first time since the beating. Each new arrival greeted him and all the others warmly. Everybody acted as if they were friends. Cole played their game and nodded politely, but he noticed that nobody sat beside him. Several kept eyeing him curiously. He recognized one man as Judge Tanner. The last time Cole had seen him, the judge had been wearing a black robe at the arraignment hearing in juvenile court when Cole first pleaded guilty. Tonight, Judge Tanner wore no robe and was dressed in blue jeans and a sweater. Cole's father and their lawyer, Nathaniel Blackwood, entered together, wearing dark three-piece suits and ties. They looked completely out of place. The lawyer looked as if he'd been dipped in plastic. The two nodded to Cole and seated themselves on his immediate left. Cole ignored them. Cole's mother arrived alone and seated herself on his right. She wore a party dress. Not a single hair on her head was out of place. That's all this was, Cole thought bitterly. This was just another social event. She had probably spent a couple of hours getting ready. Nothing, however, could cover up the frightened look in her eyes. Cole guessed she had probably downed a few drinks before coming, something to calm her nerves. Cole squirmed in his seat. His parents hadn't even acknowledged each other. When Garvey arrived, he sat nearby. Shifting nervously in his chair, Cole nodded to Garvey as he watched more strangers enter and be seated. It seemed like the whole world was showing up. And why not? The keepers had posted a notice on the library bulletin board with an open invitation to anyone who wanted to participate. Cole tapped his shoe against the leg of the chair. Why hadn't they just gone out in the street and hollered, Hey, everybody, come help make fun of Cole Matthews! At least none of his classmates had shown up, Cole thought. They probably knew what he'd do to them if they did. Then Cole heard more people come in and turned to see Peter walk in with his parents and their lawyer. Peter walked awkwardly, shuffling his feet and glancing timidly around the room. His lawyer looked the same age as Cole's mom, but walked with her head up and shoulders squared. Almost immediately, she picked Cole out of the circle and eyed him. He glanced down. Nearly two dozen people had joined the circle by the time the keeper stood to begin. She smiled pleasantly. Everybody, please stand and hold hands, she said. 
Michael didn't like holding hands with his parents, one on each side. His hands were clammy, and he found himself comparing his mother's frightened, weak squeeze to his father's iron-hard grip. As the keeper bowed her head, Cole peeked and caught Peter peeking back. He narrowed his eyes threateningly, and Peter looked away. Cole grinned until he realized Peter's lawyer was watching him. Great maker and healer, hear this prayer, began the keeper in a soft voice. Tonight we gather because our community has been hurt. Grant wisdom and patience as we search for wellness. Amen. As the circle sat down, the keeper drew in deep, slow breath, looking around to acknowledge each person. Still smiling, she said, Well, I see many new faces here tonight. She glanced directly at the two lawyers and Judge Tanner. Let me remind everybody, we are not here to win or lose. Justice often fails because it seeks to punish, not to heal. Jails and fines harden people. Cole found himself nodding. The keeper paused. We call this circle justice, but we really seek wellness. We tried to meet the needs of both the offender and the victim. The keeper looked directly at Cole and his family, then at Peter and his family. Circle justice is for those ready for healing. It's not an easy way out. In fact, a healing path is often much harder. The keeper held up a feather. This feather symbolizes respect and responsibility. No one must speak without this feather. When you hold this feather in your hand, speak honestly from your heart. She chuckled. <laughs> I hope I'm not being long-winded, because talking too long tells others that you don't respect their right to speak. Respect others as much as yourself. When the feather comes to you, speak only if you wish to. This circle carries only two obligations, honesty and respect. The keeper fixed her gaze on Cole. Cole Matthews, you have a long history of anger, growing more violent until you severely injured Peter Driscoll. Even now, Peter continues therapy for injuries. Cole squirmed in his chair. He didn't like being talked to with a bunch of people staring at him. The keeper raised her voice slightly and turned to the group. Our challenge is to return wellness, not only to Peter Driscoll, but also to Cole Matthews and to our community. We'll pass the feather several times tonight, introducing ourselves, expressing concerns, and offering ideas for healing and repairing the harm. The keeper handed the feather to the first person seated on her left side. I'm Gladys Swanson, and I'm the mother of four children here in Minneapolis, the lady began. I want to help make our community better because this is the community where I'm raising my own children. I'm Frank Schaefer, the next person said. This is the first real opportunity I've had to help change the violence in our city. One by one, the people around the circle held the feather and spoke. Cole's mother fingered the feather nervously during her turn. I'm Cindy Matthews, Cole's mom, she said. I'm here because I don't know what to do anymore. It's gotten so hard. She paused, her bottom lip trembling, then handed the feather to Cole. The room grew extra quiet, and Cole's face warmed. Squeaking chairs and shuffling shoes broke the anxious silence. Cole coughed to clear his throat. A lot depended on his next words. Um, I'm Cole Matthews, and I'm here because I really screwed up he said. I know what I did was wrong, and I want Peter to know I'm sorry for everything. Cole sniffled purposely, rubbing at his nose for effect. I want to ask this circle to help me get over my anger. Cole handed the feather to his father as he glanced around the group. He liked the reactions he saw. People heard what they wanted to hear. Tonight the group wanted to believe he was sorry. He could see it in their eyes. Cole's father sat up taller in his chair. I'm William Matthews, he announced importantly. I'm here to make sure that my son never causes problems again. He turned and glared at Cole. This is all going to end now. Cole ignored his father. Next, Nathaniel Blackwood received the feather. He held it loosely in his fingers as if it were a cigarette and cleared his throat loudly. Yes, 
what Cole did was wrong. But kids will be kids. Considering Cole's detention to date, we feel he should be released to parole into the supervision of one of his parents. He needs a family, not a jail cell. The lawyer handed the feather on. As the feather moved from person to person, Cole kept glancing at Peter. The thin, red-haired boy stared at the floor. When he was handed the feather, Peter looked up fearfully and mumbled. I'm Peter Driscoll, and I'm here because I got beat up. His speech was slow and halting. His eyes darted around the circle as he passed the feather quickly to his mother. Cole studied Peter. Peter hadn't sounded like this before. Cole wiped his sweaty hands on his pants. It wasn't like he had meant to hurt anyone. Besides, this wouldn't have happened if Peter had kept his mouth shut. 